All right, guys, it's not every day I come to you with a stock where I'm like, dude, I, I have to rush and put out a video to get everybody to hear about this thing because it's such an insane deal. And it's like totally not on my radar in a whole new segment for me, a whole new industry. And it capitalizes on like everything that's going on in the world right now. And I'm super excited about it. Okay, here we go. Number one, it has a $6.5 billion market cap. It's not a big company, but check out these earnings. Revenues of last quarter. Last quarter, dude. This is one quarter, they made $3.1 billion, and their market cap is $6.5 billion. How, how nuts is this? A bid of $2.1 billion, and net profit of $1.5 billion. Check it out. Here is the year-over-year -year revenue growth. Last year, this quarter, a billion. This quarter, three billion, 210% revenue growth. And a PE ratio of 3.06. A PE ratio of 3.0. Is there anything with a PE ratio that low nowadays? What is going on here, guys? Check it out. Is this stock just super under the radar and overlooked? Or is it a debt risk monster? Sometimes we th see things like occasionally something like General Electric or something will come up with a P ratio this low. Then you look into it and it's like, okay, their liabilities are like eight times bigger than their assets. So this is not really a good idea. Next, looking at the news. These are some of the news things going on right now that are going to help this stock and have been helping this stock. Retail sales, you probably already heard this. Retail sales unexpectedly rise in September as consumers keep spending. And we see it there at the bottom. Compared with a year ago, sales were up 13.9% on the headline number and 15.6% uh, excluding autos. So we're seeing, for some reason, even though nobody's working anymore, everybody is a crypto billionaire and the economy is falling apart and there's inflation, we're seeing massive retail sales exploding. And it's expected to keep exploding into this quarter because the pandemic by and large, especially in North America, is settling down. People, for some reason, even though everybody's quitting their jobs, people have like record numbers of money, record amounts of money to spend. Next, you probably already saw this one too, the CPI numbers, the Consumer Price Index, jumped 6.2% in October, the biggest inflation surge in more than 30 years. And so we've been talking about, occasionally on the channel, is inflation going to stick around? Is it going to disappear? Is it a thing that we should be factoring into our investing strategies or not? And so they just came out and said, hey, inflation is going cray cray because we printed too much money. Actually, they're not saying we printed too much money, but that's, you know, that's actually what's happening, I think. Um, so going back into the article, consumer price index surged 6.2%, core inflation, Stripping out food and energy uh, increased 4.6%, the fastest gain since 1991. So we're seeing on this slide, we're seeing retail sales going up. What else is going on? We have a big monstrous storm in Vancouver yesterday. My condolences to you if you're in uh, British Columbia, my fellow Canadians. A state of emergency has been declared in British Columbia on the top right there showing you know the rainfall accumulation, which is bonkers. A meter of rain? How do you even deal with that? How do you, I mean, even 10 centimeters of rain is already crazy. How do you deal with a meter of rain? It says store shelves have also seen their inventories running low and officials have advised residents to conserve fuel. Okay, so to get things in perspective, let's take a look at how it stacks up against a lot of the other kind of hypey stocks. First, we're going to look at Tesla. Everybody knows Tesla's valuation is cray cray. Let's check it out. So we have a $1.09 trillion market cap with a trailing PE of 353, EPS of $3, and an EV EBITDA of 148, which is super duper sky high. Remember, we're looking for something less than 20, if not less than 10. Less than 10 usually signals a really good deal. So basically right now, I think Tesla's a little over a thousand bucks, like a thousand fifty or something like that. You are paying a thousand and fifty-five dollars and your EPS you are earning, or the company is earning $3 for that $1,100. Next, let's take a look at AMD. Slightly less bonkers, but also very much capitalizing on the market fervor right now. A market cap much smaller than Tesla, $187 billion, with a trailing P of just 47. Value investors are like clawing their eyes out right now. EPS of $3.24. So they're making more money per share than Tesla is by 20 cents. 
And the EV EBITDA is still bonkers, 51, but way more sane than Tesla. Next, let's go with a company that's a little bit more uh, down to earth, a little bit more infrastructure-y, Nokia. $33 billion, a light $33 billion market cap. Um, EPS of negative 35 cents and EV EBITDA of eight. So next we're gonna add in our new stock today and I'm gonna show you just how crazy this deal is. It's a $6 billion market cap with a trailing PE of three and an EPS of $17. $17 on a $6 billion market cap, dude. And an EV a bit of 2.4. How overlooked is this company, dude? So the stock price is 55 bucks right now. So on $55, they're making $17. There are like no companies that do this. This company is six one thousandths the size, the value of the market value of Tesla. And they're making like six, almost six times more earnings per share. What is going on y'all? And to top it off, they're boosting their dividend in a way that's gonna make you go crazy. If you are a dividend person, even if you're not a dividend person, you're gonna look at this and you're gonna flip. Check it out, the new policy, interim quarterly dividends of 20% of the quarter's net income. So what kind of numbers does that work out to for this quarter? It's a $54 stock and a $2.50 per share dividend. That's a 30% dividend payout ratio. The dividend payout ratio is dividends paid divided by net, net income and typically, for those long-term buy and hold, kind of like I never sell type uh, dividend investors, they're looking for like a five, maybe three-ish percent dividend payout ratio. This company is busting a 30. Um, so it sounds scary. It sounds unreliable. It sounds undependable. It sounds like we should be running for the hills, but check it out. Here is the name of the company. It is Zim, Zim Integrated Shipping Services. This is actually their fourth time attempting IPO. They've attempted it before, and due to debt or due to other weird Markham circumstances, they took it back public. This is their fourth time, which again, sounds terrifying. Um, but through all of those ins and outs of being a publicly traded company, they learned how to really slim down the company. They learned how to really become agile and how to have a niche place in the marketplace. And recently, I'll get into this in a minute here, they've also added um, some new pivots that are not only leveraging the advantages they already have in shipping, but also leveraging the advantages of the market shifts in North America and getting into tech too. So again, I've never actually looked into shipping companies before. I've never actually studied them. I don't didn't know that much about it, but, but the last couple of days I spent a lot of time looking into it. And as you would expect, most shipping companies spend like billions of dollars buying these huge ships. A lot of them also buy the containers that you put on the ships or you rent out to other companies or things like that. But Zim's kind of specialty, one of their really big superpowers is that they're an asset light shipping company. So it says up there, one of the special things they do really well is they have commercial agility. Maintain a, they maintain a high level of fleet flexibility. Here are a bunch of their routes, but the bulk, the big majority of where they're shipping is kind of between China, Singapore, the US on that Pacific side of the map. And when we say asset light shipping, it basically means that they're spending they do own some of their ships, they do own some of their containers, but way less than almost all the competition. And therefore they can lease the boats, they can lease the uh, containers. So when capacity goes up, they can lease them and they don't mind paying higher rates for a lease because like now all these shipping companies are making bank because their boats are just sitting outside of the harbor waiting because there's so much labor shortage. There's like, you know, gas difficulties, truck driver difficulties. Um, all these different harbors around the world are having trouble staffing and bringing all this stuff in. So you combine that with the fact that there's this retail boom and there are these natural disasters going on. And it's like the profit margin just goes up and up and up, right? So more on their asset light business model, check it out owned capacity as percent of capacity in thousands of TEUs. TEUs are 20 foot equivalent units. So like a 20 foot container, you know, they have 20 foot containers and 40 foot containers. People are making houses out of them now or whatever, but you see them on the trucks, on the freeway or whatever. Um, check it out, Zim is third from the right over there. So you can see all of their competition. These are, this is their capacity owned in terms of ships and containers. Zim is 2% 
they own almost nothing. But a lot of their competition have like, you know, 30 times the amount of spending that they're having to do on their ships and containers and maintenance and all that stuff. And so, like I mentioned earlier, Zim, who's kind of been in and out, in and out of being a publicly traded company, has learned how they have to adjust and they have to slim down to keep the margins high by keeping costs low. So we're seeing here on the chart, consistent earnings growth and continued deleveraging. Deleveraging is basically like removing debt, simply put. And so the green bar is going down as the revenues are going up and up and up. And these are just by quarter. So we can see in that most recently completed quarter, three, uh, 4.7 billion uh, in revenues. And it's like spiking like crazy. And a lot of this has to do with what's going on in the market, obviously, but it's expected to continue probably deep into 22, if not into 23, but even still considering, you know, you saw the P ratios, you saw the way they're doing their dividends earlier, even considering those things, once things settle down, this is still a really good deal. And all of this leads to an industry leading adjusted EBITDA of 66%. Dude, that's like almost tech company level. So immediately one of the concerns that comes to your mind is probably what happens once the ports open up again and they're fully staffed and truck drivers are operating at full, you know, kind of again. And check it out. Here is the port of LA. One, the third, I believe it's the third biggest port in the world. Another 900,000 plus TU month at Port of Los Angeles. Year to date growth at 22% and they're on pace for a record year. And they go on to say in the article how much they've been growing. They had a really big hit uh, month in October of last year. But in general, shipping is just getting more and more and more necessary. Here's the Bloomberg chart breaking down port congestion. Supply chain disruption increases global congestion rates. So when the ports are really congested, the rates go up. The ships have to wait, but the cost, those costs are passed on to the customers. And of course it sucks and, and actually it causes inflation because you, know, you go shopping at Target you got to buy all this stuff that comes from a container. So Target's going to pass on a bunch of those costs to you, which is inflation, you know? So you investing in this company and getting some of the gains from the shipping companies also kind of a hedge against inflation, but check it out. We have the three biggest ports, Shanghai, uh, Shenzhen and Los Angeles, all almost 50, uh, Shanghai is almost 50% congested. The other two are over 50%. But then we also have Singapore. All four of those are bases where Zim works and primarily emphasizes their focus on. But we also have Busan. Uh, I believe they work in Rotterdam as well. And so while we're seeing all this port congestion around the world, Zim is just raking in the money. Elevated freight rates driven by high demand coupled by supply chain challenges. Charter higher trend correlates with freight trend. So on the right, we have the standard Clarkson's rate of charter hire. You can see in August, all of them spike up. All those different colors are basically different sizes of ships and all of them spike up. Zim works with most sizes of ships, but I believe their main would probably fall under that purple line. And so these numbers on the Clarkson are the price that the customers are paying to Zim. So let's check it out again. That price is just trending up. It's expected to stay high for at least another quarter if not two or three, and then eventually fade back down. But here is the other side of the equation, one year container ship leasing rate. So this is what Zim is paying to the company who's leasing them their containers. You can see that going up as well, which sucks for Zim, but Zim just passed that on to the customer. And again, that's one of the things that makes Zim really special because even when the market is going crazy and they have to pay a lot of money for their leases, which by the way, many of them are, most of them are like three to five year leases and were signed before the prices started going crazy. But second of all, when demand slows down again, they can just let go of those leases and they don't have to be paying any more money. It's kind of like renting an apartment versus renting a house. If you have 10 kids, you might need to rent three apartments, but once all the kids grow up and move out, then you and your wife can just settle back down in one apartment. Super weird example. I don't know why that came to my mind, but that's what came to my mind. You know, whereas if you went and bought a $2 million house with 10 rooms for all the kids and then they all moved out, you'd be like, dude, this house is too big for us now. And again, breaking down some of the financial results we have uh, year over year on the left side, up 210% and quarter over quarter on the right side, up 32%. And here we have EBITDA on the top from 
262 million up to 2 billion <laughs> year over year. And then we see, and then when we take out depreciation and amortization, which are the DA in EBITDA and calculate the EBIT, we see even more massive gains. And again, like I mentioned earlier, net profit up year over year, almost 10 X and then quarter over quarter, almost double, not quite. We have a significant improvement in all metrics the nine months of 2021 versus the nine months of last year, 2020 revenues are up 176%. EBIT's up 3.4 billion. EBIT is up 3.7 billion. Net profits up 2.7 billion. And then this next one's a really neat illustration that shows us on the left cash flow from operations. Then you take out the CapEx capital expenditures, which is like spending on machinery and equipment and stuff like that. So you subtract that and then you end up with your free cash flow, which is 1720. That's just money that they have sitting around doing nothing now after all the operations from last quarter are complete. Then we take out our debt service, 273. Then we take out the dividend, 237. And then we're left with the net change in total cash position. Super duper strong. One of the things I mentioned earlier was that one of the trends in North America right now I'm not sure if you've heard about this. Basically, small business creation is booming. A lot of people are sick of working for their bosses uh, due to stimulus or actually I've heard recently that a lot of people have quit their jobs because they made a bunch of money on Bitcoin too, which is cool. But as we're seeing unemployment uh, increasing, actually a lot of those people are starting companies. So check out this chart. We're seeing monthly business applications after the corona start at in spring of 2020, we see it spike up. And I suspect it's going to be staying up in this kind of new era, new generation. And you might be following the stock called Shopify, which helps you make a website and a store. And like a lot, almost all of these stores are people buying stuff from different places around the world and selling it in their online store. And so as the number of small businesses are increasing, we're going to continue to see, I think, growth in these numbers, demand for these kinds of services where people are just importing stuff from all around the world. And that brings us to our next tech pivot that I was mentioning for uh, Zim. One of the really difficult things about small business when you're wholesaling, when you're importing stuff is when you're working in really small quantities, it makes sense to just use a plane and they'll ship it to you in a box and then you open it and then you sell it on your store or you sell it to another store who's going to sell it on their store or whatever. But once the quantities start getting bigger and you're talking about like a pallet or two pallets or four pallets, it's not a full container. So how do you import this stuff from around the world? And that's where freight forwarding comes in. And Zim has just started up in October, this service called Ship Forward. Say hello to business friendly logistics. So they help you to, it says down there, ocean services for, you know, ocean shipping for LCL or FCL shipments. And LCL is less than a container load and FCL is, you know, a full container. So there might be situations where you're like, dude, I only need half a container. What can I do with this? And so, so freight forwarders will help you figure that out. And so one of the things ship forward does is helps particularly small businesses to deal with their loads, wherever they're coming from in a way that's up to kind of our modern demands, our modern requirements. You buy stuff on Amazon, at least here in Japan, you can like track it on Amazon and it'll say, it's been delivered from Tokyo. Now it's in your city. Now it's on the truck and it will be arriving this morning. Okay, now it's been delivered at your front door and here is the picture of that. Like you can see it really granular. And I think Ship Forward is trying to take um, freight forwarding kind of into this new generation and make it in a way where you can do everything really easily online and manage it, particularly for these small and mid-sized companies for people who are starting shops online. They also have air services for rush orders. They have value added services like customs clearance, which is a huge pain in the neck, insurance, which is also frustrating and difficult, land transportation, and more. In the past, when I've done things, it's like, you'll talk to the factory and they'll be like, okay, we'll make you this stuff. How do you want us to get it to you? Then you have to figure out another person who can get it from the factory, get it to the port. And then you have to get a shipping company from the port to Japan or US or Canada or Britain, wherever you're at. And then you need to be able to get it to your own office or your own house. And these are all different steps in the process that are all different people. And insurance can often be different on all of them too. And so ship forward is just kind of making it a nice, really easy, neat little package. 
24-7 shipping, logistics visibility, flexible finance. That's pretty neat. Favorable pricing and flexible 30, 45, and 60-day payment terms, which is another one of those things that is just like such a thorn in your side when you're dealing with all these different little companies. Some of them are like no PayPal. Some of them are like only PayPal. Some of them are like you just have to send us a money order. And it's like the dark ages, it feels like, when you're trying to do this stuff. So here's their press release. I just wanted to read it real quick because it's super helpful. A digital freight forwarding platform offering an online, simple, and reliable self-service end-to-end shipping solution. Launched in October 18, 2021. ShipForward will target U.S. and Canadian, small and medium-sized businesses, importing and exporting from China, Vietnam, and Israel. Then going down to this part, the new digital freight forwarding company will provide small and medium businesses, as well as entrepreneurs worldwide, a simple and direct solution for shipping cargo through an advanced one-stop shop digital platform. So while we're looking at this company who's not only capitalizing on all of the chaos that's happening in the world, they can flexibly increase their capacity to capitalize even more on that. But once it eases off, they'll still be able to maximize the smaller amount of demand that's going on around the world using platforms like this that are sure to breed all kinds of loyalty. So here's another look at their strong execution on the top left, 113 operating ships. They just purchased eight new secondhand vessels. They also went in to talk about on the top right, they're expanding LNG fueled fleets, which is liquid nitrogen gas. And so almost regardless of what industry you're in, there's this push towards green, there's this push towards being environmentally friendly. And one of the neat things about having a really flexible fleet is that you can use the ones that are green, you can use the ones that are more flexible, and with their huge cash position, they can be buying the newest tech. And like I mentioned earlier, maintaining a high level of fleet flexibility down there on the bottom left, and in the bottom right, digitalization and innovation. So these are things that are really separating Zim from the other shipping companies. And like we talked about earlier, most small businesses are importing stuff from Asia and that's really where Zim focuses because that's where they have a competitive advantage and that's also where they're the most profitable, I believe. So here we see the industry average on the left. That's their breakdown of how they ship stuff around the world. Whereas Zim is much more concentrated in the Pacific areas. Down here at the bottom, according to Alpha Liner, Zim is the world's 10th largest liner but it is the most exposed to the Trans-Pacific. It had 52% of capacity deployed in this this trade versus the industry average of just 19% as of October. Next, let's take a closer look at some of the financial positions. I just wanted to take a look at assets and liabilities to see, you know, if this really is just a huge monstrous debt trap. Check it out. We have total current assets of 4.1 billion, total current liabilities of 2.6 billion down here. Above that, we have cash and equivalents of two point, almost $2.5 billion, which can almost cover their total current liabilities just with their cash on hand. And for those who are curious, we have non-current lease liabilities of $1.7 billion, which sounds super monstrous. And then we have current uh, lease liabilities and contract liabilities of about $1.4, $1.5 billion. Which is not actually crazy considering they just made $4.7 billion in one quarter. So touching a little bit more on the management and leadership, I think one of the really neat things to see is that they're, they figured out a strategy for what works now in today's world. And it, I think it's just kind of all the stars aligned and it's a perfect situation for them because they're so concentrated in the Pacific, because they have so much capacity right now while the world's going through all of these different weird shocks, causing the cost of shipping to go up. This is obviously padding their margins big time, but they're doing it in a way that makes it so that they can pass the value on to the shareholder too. Now, one of the questions you're probably thinking is, why are they paying so much in dividends? Why wouldn't they just keep more of that money and reinvest? And I think there are a few different answers to that. Number one is that they don't want to be buying ships because that's their strategy. They are using the money to start up a new kind of tech, I guess you would call it tech website services like Ship Forward, where they can transition better once these margins decrease a little bit. Secondly, this is just another thought I had. I didn't they didn't, you know, announce this officially or anything like that, but When a company wants to be noticed, when it wants to hit headlines, when it wants to meme on Reddit, you know, they go out and they 
put out 20% dividends. And normally when you see this, it's like run for the hills because this company doesn't know what they're doing. They're just going to be basically taking out loans to pay you for the money they're borrowing from you. And a lot of times it's just like this death cyclone, you know, kind of thing. These guys, Zim, haven't necessarily committed to, you know, X dollars per share. They just say 20% of net income. And if that net income is a little, is much smaller again sometime in the future in a year or two, then the dividend will shrink and they're okay with that. They're not committing to, you know, long-term ultra crazy growth like dividend aristocrats or anything like that. And so by doing something really, really aggressive like this, their dividend actually used to just be once a year. Now it's four times a year. Now it's much more aggressive. That gets, that accesses the whole cohort of investors who are like, I want regular dividend income, you know? And so in this case, if you were to get your hands on this dividend, if you put in 10 grand into the stock, let's say you'd, you'd get 500 bucks for this quarter. Now I can't find when the next X date will be. So the X date is when you need to be owning the stocks to be able to get the next dividend. But I think it'll be kind of like January or something like that. I'm not sure. Don't hold me that. And if you know, let me know, let me know down in the comment section. But yeah, so raising your dividend like this can, while they're already paying off their debt load, super sufficiently and racking up cash, they can get the attention of new investors to come in and continue to grow in whatever way is suitable. And I suspect they're going to be sticking to the plan because it sounds like they've got beaten down in the past by trying to go public and then going private again and then going public and then going private again. And this is their fourth time. And so they've been through the grinder, I think. <laughs> and it's interesting because when you look around on the internet, there's like a little bit of information. There's like a couple of people talking about it on Twitter. There's a couple of people, a couple of threads on Reddit. It's not meme level, but if it gets into the right places, I think it could meme just because it's so profitable and so cheap. It's like what we said at the beginning, it's a $55 stock making $17 of earnings per share. Whereas, you know, all these kind of meme stocks, Tesla, it's a more than a thousand dollar stock making $3 a share. This is like almost six times, dude. This is crazy earnings. This is crazy growth. And the way things are going, not only the management's forecasts, but in, uh, industry insiders are also saying this will continue into the fourth quarter. We're expecting even stronger retail sales into the fourth quarter. And that's going to be spilling over into probably first and second quarter of next year. And you might as well be getting a juicy dividend. And it's also an inflation hedge. And it's also capitalizing on growth in all these different industries and chaos in all these different industries and regions. So again, here's our share price. We're sitting at about 54 bucks today. It's kind of fluctuated up and down, you know, five or eight bucks recently. It's not super volatile stock, but you know, after looking into this, I'm pretty set on a price target of at least 75 bucks. I wouldn't be surprised if we break 80 in the coming weeks or months. So needless to say, I'm really into this stock. Like I'm, you remember how I was with AMD a few months ago, like in March, April, May, where I was like, I need as much as I can. Like I'm kind of doing that with Zim right now. <laughs> what do you guys think about it? Have you been invested in this industry? Do you know about these kinds of stocks? Let me know down in the comment section. We can have a discussion. I need to learn more about what's going on, but I'm really excited about this stock. Love you guys. Thank you so much for watching and sticking around to the end and stay generous.